What's up, everybody? Welcome back to your latest installment of Nuclear Barbarians. It is I, your nuclear barbarian, Emmett Penny, and I am here with everyone's favorite freaked out green chicken, Doomberg. What is up, Doomberg? It is great to have you here. Emmett, feels like a uh, long time in the making. Real honor to be here with you. Love your work. Uh, avid reader of everything you put out and looking forward to a fantastic discussion today. <laughs> Yeah, uh, as am I. Uh, the feeling is mutual. For those that don't know, we were joking before uh, recording that we're sure our audience is like the Venn diagram is a circle. But for those who don't know, Doomberg is one of the most successful Substacks out there. Correct? You guys are just crushing it. It's uh, it's been a fun ride. Yeah, we are the number one finance Substack uh, in the world, which is kind of shocking wow. and amazing and humbling. Wow. And We've been paid for 11 months now, so coming up on the big annual renewal season, <laughs> which is kind of scary and exciting all at the same time. And um, sure. I believe we were we we're in, I think we're in the top five on the whole platform. They won't tell us officially, but they hint and wink at us um, to that effect. <laughs> so, but it's been a real great experience. And, um, you know, uh, it's this whole alternative media, which you've been trying to capitalize on your own way, um, mm -hmm. is really exploding. And, and we do think that the, sort of failures of traditional media, which I actually think are brought upon by Google and Facebook taking all the money out from under the traditional media mm -hmm. and, and forcing them to to do things that, um, that the general public might not like, is opening up a huge opportunity for individual content creators. And we've been fortunate to catch that wave at the right time with the right product, with the right discipline. And it's been really rewarding. And we've stopped doing basically everything else that we were doing before Doomberg. And Doomberg is now the work of our lives. And Wow. And it's just um, a real thrill. Man, that's great news. That makes me happy to hear. Um, so speaking of the work of your lives, you have recently published a piece on, uh, which has a great title, There She Blows, um, which is about the, the kerfuffles over <laughs> offshore wind uh, in the New England area, which is something that I've been keeping my eye on. I got hip to it first from Robert Bryce, uh, just because, as you mentioned in the piece, you know, I don't think anybody keeps his close eye on <laughs> renewables rejections than Robert. Uh, I think he may, 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 maybe even does a better job than the industry. Um, so why don't you just tell me real quick, what's the lowdown? What what the hell is going on over there? Yeah, you bet. So we, we've, through Doomberg, you know, we meet many people and somebody introduces us to somebody who introduces us to somebody who is very passionate about um, whales and the... <laughs> the potential negative impact that the ongoing development of offshore wind uh, along the Atlantic coast is having on the whale population. And at first, you know, we kind of, you know, okay, this is, you know, uh, environmental crime on environmental crime, you know, and, but at the same time, we started to dig into it and we've become relatively friendly with this person who's very passionate about it. And, and um, she kept feeding our inbox with, you know, another whale washed up on shore another whale hmm. washed up on shore. And, and we're seeing, a real spike in in whale beachings and um, the opponents to offshore wind believe that even just the preparatory work that's going on to lay the groundwork for what will be a wave of offshore wind development if biden's ambitions come to fruition uh, even that preparatory work is causing these whales to go deaf and then they end up you know a deaf whale is a dead whale and who knows like mm, the science mm. is, is a little unclear on the topic if i'm being totally sort of agnostic to the situation. But what really caught our attention and what motivated us to write the piece was the speed with which the federal government absolutely and completely absolved the wind industry of any and all, uh, you know, the science shows <laughs> that uh, yeah. they have nothing to do uh, with the death of these wells. And you just contrast that with the way in which the federal government handles the nuclear industry. And, and we had just previously published a piece called Nuclear Waste, where we eviscerated the NRC, which I'm sure was a piece that you enjoyed. Um, yes. And and just the contrast between the manner in which the NRC goes about its business and the manner in which the uh, you know the, the fisheries um, of of the NOAA uh, just absolves the wind industry of any and all uh, and all wrongdoing just shows you the rank hypocrisy of our regulatory regime where certain industries are just chosen as quote good and they mm -hmm. can do no wrong which gives them a license to do and get away with things that the fossil fuel industry or the nuclear industry would never even dream of, of, of attempting. And, and um, that hypocrisy is sort of, um, 
it's a quintessential Doomberg piece, I guess, is you sort of have this kernel of hypocrisy and let the reader mm -hmm. get frustrated by reading it. And <laughs> and then and we have a fair bit of experience directly in uh, the wind industry, and so we use that opening story, which is always a good hook, to sort of give our views on the wind sector, the the, the pros, the cons, and the propaganda. And um, and and to it was the first piece we'd ever written about wind, even though we've written something like 175 plus pieces here in the last almost two years, wow. but uh, we decided to actually uh, put our position on wind out there for our readership. And uh, it was a fun piece and I love the title too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was a blast. I mean, the Noah thing is really interesting to me because I went digging into some of their reports on right whales. That's the type of whale I think that's that's being threatened here, right? Those are the ones that well, are washing up. Well, all the whales are washing it? up, but those whales are uh, on the endangered species list. Right. So okay. Concern. Yeah. No, a helpful helpful correction. Uh it is sad to know that it is a diverse population of whales that is being injured here. Um and it was really funny because in the report, they were sort of like, well, they're sort of like, it, it's the logical thing, right? They're like, well, we're building these things sometimes exactly where their habitat is, and we don't have the data yet because real work hasn't really started, but you can kind of tell something's going to happen. And then a lot of like front-facing stuff, press stuff from NOAA uh, does exactly what you said. It's just exonerating. It's yeah, like, don't it, even it, dream of trying to make a connection that we very cautiously allege in one of our own reports. Yeah, it, it, we described in the piece as, quote, confidently and definitively absolves the wind industry of any and all potential blame. <laughs> it's, and just yeah. the instinctive reaction, you know, the reactionary um, aspect of this is mm -hmm. it just shows you what a dedicated bureaucracy can do um, in, mm. the, in, in the prior piece so around nuclear waste, where basically the NRC has 3,000 people who have no job other than to say no, which we, we could do as a small team and not interrupt our publication cadence. Like we, <laughs> I'd be happy to take one-tenth, one-one-hundredth of the NRC's annual budget and just mm -hmm. tell the industry no on everything it decides to do and mix in a few random softballs where we say yes for a while and then undo our yes and say no and ruin all their investor confidence. Um, and so, um, you know, but the, but the, the point is, um, if in certain industries, solar and wind, um, biomass, mm. uh, re renewable diesel, um, the, they can do no wrong. They can pollute at will. They can um, increase carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. They could uh, introduce uh, intermittency into the grid, which causes everybody's bills to go up. It doesn't matter because that industry is is regulatorily blessed. It right. is sainted. It is sainted. Um, it's it been is, chosen. It has been chosen. And that's fine. You know, we we have a, a pro tier at Doomberg where, you know, for um, our, our most loyal subscribers, we do a monthly webinar and, and we did a full, you know, um, hour long review of the alternative energy landscape with pros, cons and propaganda and our honest view. Like, here's the pros of solar. Here's the cons. Here's the propaganda around it. And and propaganda is, is always takes one of two forms. It either um, radically amplifies the benefits of the chosen technologies or radically amplifies the uh, the concerns or the or the costs uh, of the uh, of, of the unchosen technologies fossil fuels and, and nuclear power and, and mm -hmm. you could very easily see uh, for example levelized cost of electricity as you know is is, is borderline yes. fraud. it's just fraud and um and this is bantied about in in pure propaganda um for wind and solar and and so, um, but you know, as, as we say, one of the ongoing themes of many of the Doomberg pieces is there are no solutions; there are only trade-offs. And so, yes. we need to quantify the trade-offs and mm. then collectively decide, with an accurate quantification of those trade-offs, um, which and which of the technologies we will center our energy policy around and why. And we don't have an honest discussion. So, in the absence of an honest discussion around trade-offs, we get political grift. Uh, we mm. get um, raw, bare knuckles politics, and um, and the thing about the wind piece, there she blows, is it really is dividing the subset of the environmental progressive left that cares deeply about these animals, and I think authentically so, mm -hmm. uh, versus the sort of grift machine that wants the Inflation Reduction Act renewable money train to keep flowing 
uh, regardless of the consequence to uh, to the environment. You know, um, and so it was a fun piece to write. But really, that with that that opening story was just a wrapper around our first sort of articulation of our authentically held views with a science background of the pros, cons, and propaganda of wind, which, by the way, we have direct experience in the industry. It's a decade or a decade and a half old, but, you know, the, these industries don't change that much. And so, you know, when we, no, update, so, you know. So tell me about that. Tell me a little bit about, if you can, about that experience and, <laughs> sure. and what you're seeing is wrong with wind. Let's get into the meat of it. So our um, our experience comes from our time in industry where we worked on a variety of, of renewable technologies supplied into these developments. And in particular, we observed the spectacular rise and catastrophic cratering of the Chinese wind sector um, at the turn of the knots uh, into mm. the 2010s. And and that just shows you just how heavily dependent this was on the whims of government. The, it's a long story that we don't need to get into, but there were certain, um, you know, um, uh, local uh, liberties granted if you uh, kept your wind farm below, you know, 50 megawatts, I believe it was. And and, hmm. and that, of course, caused a lot of 49.9 megawatt facilities that weren't well planned to be plugged into the grid to to be created. And then all of a sudden, you know, the feds realized what was going on and they put a stop to yeah. it overnight and killed the industry. But that's that's into the weeds um, at its core, as Robert Bryce has has articulated and others know the fundamental challenge with wind energy is its low power density, uh, mm. which means you need vast swaths of areas and volumes really to uh, capture and concentrate the rotational energy that you can extract from wind uh, into you know, ultimate electricity through gearboxes and, and whatnot. And that means you have to have um, extraordinarily long wind blades. And the longer your wind blade is, the mm. more extreme the forces um, that that blade will experience which requires an ever increasing sophisticated um, material science to create materials that are both lightweight and exceptionally strong. Um, the forces that these um, materials are subjected to are substantial, of course, and it's, you know, 200 miles an hour tip wind, wind speed, tip speeds uh, in these turbines in, in offshore wind are, is not uh, uncommon. And of course, um, converting that kinetic energy into rotational energy and then fed into the gearbox and so on, um, that requires exceptional material science, which to be fair, the world has uh, many, many exceptional material scientists and they mm -hmm. have been toiling away at this problem and they have developed innovative solutions, you know, carbon fiber reinforced, um, you know, um, plastic composites and so on. Um, the problem is the very nature of that challenge causes these materials to be uh, indestructible, <laughs> which means they can't be recycled. Um, and then unlike solar panels or batteries, um, there's nothing of, of particular economic value in these blades. I mean, there's economic value in the gearboxes and the motor and the, the mm -hmm. magnets and all of that stuff. But um, the blades, just on a mass perspective, you know, um, are huge, heavy, um, and you can't be, they can't be recycled. They're indestructible. You can't crush them. You know, like the first thing you do when you go to a recycling facility is you pulverize everything. <laughs> um, and, and you can't do that with these wind blades. And so they are effectively destined to be buried in landfills permanently. They don't biodegrade either. And these are thermoset, like they're set. The word set in thermoset matters um, for the hmm. material scientists in the world who are, you know, who are listening. Um, and so you you basically make these blades that are, many ways um, artisanal and they are, they're hand laid and they're made in these giant factories, put them on these giant trucks. And then you clear cut all these forests to make room for them if you're doing it in Germany. And, and then what do you do when, when the blades reach end of life? Um, you know, some of these blades are a hundred meters long and um, there are tens and tens of thousands of these blades coming to the end of their life. This is just really the first wave of, of, wind technology. You know, we haven't even reached the knee of the exponential that the environmentalists believe is necessary to have a meaningful impact on the uh, carbon intensity of the grid. Uh, now, there are some benefits to wind, which we, we laid out in the piece. So um, even though it is intermittent, um, you do get twice the capacity factor of solar because the wind mm. still blows at night. And so if solar is roughly 25%, wind is roughly 50%, maybe 45, 48 in that range, depending on mm -hmm. the installation. 
Um, and so it does blow at night and um, it is intermittent, but it's a little little more predictable, I guess, in the sense you could get good weather predictions over days and, and match it to the grid needs and have your peaker plants uh, fire off and fire down um, as needed. Um, and the other advantage of wind versus solar is the energy return on energy invested. Uh, the payback period there is a little better because polysilicon is one of the world's most energy intense starting materials, whereas, mm -hmm. you know, epoxy or pick your favorite thermoset resin and carbon fiber, um, while they're certainly energy intense, they don't, they're not nowhere near as energy intense as polysilicon. And so by and large, the payback period is estimated to be measurably less than a year, whereas mm -hmm. we estimate that the solar energy payback period is probably five years, but that's a hyper-political number as the, as the proponents of, uh, of these renewable technologies can be a little bit, uh, they tend to, they tend to make certain assumptions in their analysis that, that tends to get the outcome that uh, is socially acceptable within their um, right, fun, yeah. fun, funding communities. But we believe for the sort of average, you know, solar installation uh, along the Sun Belt in the U.S., the energy return on energy invested is is a five year payback period, probably ten years in Germany. Whereas with wind, you could probably say with confidence it's eight months, nine months, ten months. And so, um, right, those are the advantages of wind. The disadvantages are intermittency. The disadvantages are lack of um, renew, uh, ability to to, um, to recycle because there's nothing valuable to go claim. Uh, and then mm -hmm. the last part is um, it's just expensive. Like I know people claim with levelized cost of electricity that this is somehow some panacea. Uh, but as we say in the piece, like if it were truly the cheapest form of energy available today, um, three things, the industry would not need massive subsidies for its proliferation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, even with significant government support, we can't find anyone in the wind value chain making any money. Um, and then finally, really? well, I mean, all these companies are writing down their businesses. Uh, their, what's the number one driving factor for for input costs of making wind turbines? Fossil fuels. And so the energy yeah. crisis crippled these people just like it did polysilicon. Right. Um, you mentioned in the piece that GE, uh, yeah. their renewables arm, what, lost like uh, $2.2 billion. 2 billion. billion. Yeah. Yeah. And by yeah. the way, if people want a good deep dive into what went wrong at GE. You can check out the last interview with William Cohen about yep. his doorstopper of a book, uh, Power Failure, The Rise and Fall of an American Icon. Just doing a little plug there for for Billy and me. Yeah, I really enjoyed that podcast and um, a great get for you to have him on your show. And uh, But yeah, exactly. So all of these you know major wind turbine manufacturers are hemorrhaging cash. Um, and then the third point, just to sort of round it out, you know, mm -hmm. um, is that everywhere where there's large penetration of wind and solar, the the the, the cost of electricity is higher. And so, yeah. like, show me where the cheapness flows through to any form of reality. Um, and so that, that that's our view. Right. I think that's a good point. I I want to ask you just like one one little question for for um, uh, those who might not be as close to this as you and I are, because we've we've said it a few times here, and we can keep talking about. The levelized cost of uh, of energy or ELCO. What uh, can you give sort of a layman's description of what that is and why it's powerful for renewables advocates? At its core, levelized cost of electricity. Um, look, anytime you do a calculation, it all boils down to your assumptions, mm -hmm. right? And if you have a desire to put your thumb on the scale, um, as a scientist or as an economist or as an analyst, it's very easy to do. You just put all your assumptions in the footnotes and then blare the headline. Um, at its core, levelized cost of electricity ignores the fact that there's a grid that needs to receive this electricity when it's produced. Hmm. Um, and so it assumes that all the electricity uh, is basically meeting marginal demand. Mm -hmm. So the fact that you need peaking plants because of the intermittency, those costs don't get ascribed to the wind and solar ledger. Those get assigned to the grid. And so, like any analysis, um, it boils down to your assumptions. And assumptions require, quote, management discretion to borrow, you know, an accounting fraud detection scheme. You know, uh, mm -hmm. when we are investigating or doing analysis of a company for potential fraud, we zero in on all of the parameters in the income statement, the balance sheet, and the cash flow statement where management has significant discretion. Because guess what? They always choose discretion that favors them. Mm. And it's the exact same phenomenon with levelized cost electricity. So it can't be that wind is the cheapest form of electricity, but everywhere it's implemented, electricity costs go up. Mm -hmm. So at its core, you can think of levelized cost electricity 
as sort of a marginal production cost for wind once it's installed, regardless of all the other negative consequences it introduces to the grid. In our right. view, so, so assume away the physicality of the grid, and this thing is great for the grid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, assuming that you will be able to receive all of the energy it produces as it's produced and won't need any extra energy when it's not producing. That's levelized <laughs> cost of electricity in a nutshell. And so, um, you know, the cost of a natural gas peaker plant to the grid that is necessarily introduced by the introduction of, of intermittency is not counted in the cost of the energy produced by the intermittent sources. If we had a, you see what I'm saying? So um, mm -hmm. what do yes, I mean I by a, a peaker power plant is a natural gas power plant, let's say, that only comes on when it's needed and never produces when it doesn't, which means for that plant in isolation, it's extraordinarily expensive to run. As you know, yeah. power is a commodity. And and the number one and driver- it's, And it's hard on the plant. Ramping is hard. Of course. It's hard on the wind wind turbines when they have to, when they, like, again, the, the, the ramping of the turbines is one of the the forces that that is is in play here. It's mm -hmm. very difficult things to, to manage. And so- um, a peaker plant that, you know, in the commodity sector and producing electricity is literally a commodity because it's a price taker's market. Um, mm -hmm. In the commodity sector, the number one driver of profitability is capacity utilization, period. And so if you're a refinery and you're operating at 93%, you know, capacity, you're printing cash. And if you're operating at 78% capacity, you're hemorrhaging cash. Mm. And these peaker plants are operating by definition at very low capacity. So nobody wants to own them. Nobody wants to run them. Um, they're super expensive because you're paying the fixed cost depreciation of an entire plant that is mostly not operating. Right. And th those those costs are ignored uh, in the levelized cost of electricity. And and I guess you know like so this is something this is some scuttlebutt I've heard out of ERCOT in Texas is that um, uh, the peaker plants that seem to thrive or do it the most really have really just figured out built everything in their business model around high scarcity pricing. So they That's are antagonistic to predatory firm, pricing. Yeah. 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 They're antagonistic to firmer base load getting put in because it eats at what they're trying to pull off. So this we wrote a piece um about Bitcoin mining, actually, mm -hmm. that covered this. And um so in in Bitcoiners love you, Doomberg. Uh, yeah, well, you know, it's interesting. We are very skeptical on crypto, but we have a mm -hmm. very open mind on things, as we always mm -hmm. try to do. And yeah. uh, and and we I have... guess, yeah, I'm sort of generalizing there, right? Like, yeah. I think people too casually collapse Bitcoin and crypto together yeah. the same thing. Like... I would say the Bitcoin maxis appreciate a little Doomberg. And and yeah. we have we have a fair number of them amongst our subscribers. So the piece we published in November is called A Fine Mess, where we talk about um, how Bitcoin, in a way... Mm -hmm. um, it can help solve um, the peaker plant problem and, in fact, in, in certain scenarios, enable a higher penetration of renewables into our grid than would otherwise be. And how, how can they do that? Um, if you believe Bitcoin has value, and, and enough people do, and there's a network effect that's sort of, you know, like, I mean, money has value because enough people believe it's valuable. Gold yeah, right, yeah. has value because enough people believe it's valuable. There's no shortage of people who think Bitcoin is valuable. You could run a peaker plant that can turn on a dime and allow it to mine Bitcoin to generate revenue while it's not feeding the grid. And then if it feeds yes. the grid, when um, when the grid needs it, and it could charge elevated prices for that service, then you actually have an economically compelling reason to build mm -hmm. and operate peaker plants. But yes. uh, this was done in New York um, near Seneca Lake, you know, uh, an old coal plant was uh, retrofit to to run on natural gas. Um, Green Ridge uh, Generation LLC is is the the Green Ridge Generating Station, and they they were you know um, they bought the plant and they were all sort of Bitcoin maxi types, and they had this great mm -hmm. idea, which in their mind made perfect sense. You know, we could um, be ready to feed the grid on a second's notice, um, and, but when the grid doesn't need us, we'll just be running our plant ninety nine percent of the time and running our Bitcoin machines and generating revenue. Mm -hmm. um and um but the that concept that you're burning natural gas to mine for bitcoin um is, is created an uproar on the environmental left center elizabeth warren got involved and you mm -hmm. know basically new york has banned bitcoin mining for all intents and purposes yeah of course um of course. even though 
this is an economic justification <laughs> that will allow a greater penetration of, of intermittent sources like wind and, and solar into New York's electricity grid. And so this goes back to you know trade-offs and choices. Mm -hmm. Like there are no solutions here. And so it's 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 fascinating. You know, it, the the it was a it's a fun piece to write. Um and and again, these there's these are some hard questions, you know, like I mean, um what are we trying to do here? So like you literally can't run a grid on only intermittent sources unless you're willing to um, withstand, you know, power collapse, uh, power grid collapses the moment you need it the most. But um, at the, the social preview for a fine mess uh, reads the, the power industry is no place for small companies with innovative ideas, as you know, researching mm -hmm. the sector and the great pieces you've written um, that this is not an industry um, ripe for innovation. No, it's not. You know, I think, Looking at the past year, right? So, uh, when did you launch Doomberg? When did you guys launch? <clears throat> we launched free in May of 2021, and we went behind the paywall uh, in May of 2022. Okay. Um, and I launched Grid Brief like a week or two before Russia rolled into Ukraine. Um, and I would have to say that this last year has been filled with surprises in energy um some of which i think you and i did not find so surprising but which a lot of other people uh were shocked by things like fuel switching from natural gas to coal because coal is cheaper and so i kind of want to open up the discussion here we've talked about wind we've i think really talked about some important aspects of what's going on in the grid what are you seeing change either in the outlook of energy for the world, or just in the discourse of energy today? So we, we just published a piece called um, The Streisand Effect, where we talked about how the headlong rush into intermittent sources of energy has caused the world in a sort of unexpected consequence to re-embrace and have a renaissance with coal. <clears throat> and in the piece, um, we created this chart, which, which, um, which we find very useful, where we, you know, one of the challenges in analyzing energy is all of these primary fuels trade in different units of exchange. Mm -hmm. And then those fuels have different inherent energy sources. And so we've created this chart where we have, um, you know, in, in their traditional units stretched the sort of pricing gauge of natural gas, coal, and oil to all match dollars per million BTU um, under the assumption that there's 24 million BTUs and a ton of coal and, you know, 500 and, um, and uh, you know, 5.8 million BTUs in, in a barrel of oil. And so if you match, mm -hmm you know, all of that to dollars per million BTU, then you have a very simple read across chart where you can see like back in September, European natural gas was trading at several times the price of Newcastle coal and oil. Mm -hmm. But most importantly in that chart, coal for the very first time in history that we can find on an energy content basis was trading at a higher price than oil, which is pretty amazing wow. when you think about it because oil can be refined into diesel and gasoline and asphalt and glues and chemicals yeah. and so on. And coal can only be burned, you would think. But as we quoted, you know, Dr. Chris Kiefer's great decouple podcast where he had Mark Nelson on for the coal masterclass, one of the amazing benefits of coal is you can just stockpile a giant pile of it in a mountain next to your power factory. And mm -hmm. you can know definitively that you have enough energy to make it through the winter or pick your favorite time period. Mm -hmm. And so the market was signaling in our view, stagflation, like we have a shortage of primary energy and we don't have a need for finished goods, which means we're going to have inflation and not much growth in the economy. Um, but more importantly, we think that this months long market anomaly fore foretold the death knell of efforts to meaningfully reduce carbon emissions. The rest of the world watched what Germany did and didn't listen to what Germany said. Germany got through the winter through the miracle of an extraordinarily warm weather and the fact that they brought back on 16 gigawatts of coal <laughs> and they're burning yeah. coal with reckless abandon and they don't care. Like the moment that their populace became at risk, um, they switched back to coal and the rest of the world watched what Germany did, ignored what yeah, they and, said. And, and, and in they're some doing cases suffered what Germany did. Oh, right? Pakistan, cases... exactly. Right. We yeah. Go to that piece. And Indonesia, one of the big sort of classic Doomberg uh, moments in our piece, uh, Indonesia has announced this with great fanfare, this green industrial park. And of mm -hmm. course, the park will eventually 
be powered by solar and hydro. But for now, we're going to power that park with coal. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, like we'll we'll sell the world all the green metals they're willing to overpay for, but uh, we'll just be keeping coal in our back pocket for when our population needs it. And mm-hmm. and as we said in the piece, you know, the Streisand effect, the, the the boomerang having the unintended consequence, the precise opposite objective um, is happening, which is um, by triggering the global energy crisis of 21, 22, Europe has taught the world that uh, they best not abandon coal. And mm. and the hysteresis effect here, we think is going to be pronounced, which is, you know what I mean by hysteresis effect? Like no, tell me about that. So there's like, um, it's a magnetism thing. It's sort of a nice mental model, but um, mm. the lingering effects of history, like people remember this. It doesn't it doesn't just go away when the immediate crisis is solved in the back of every you know developing nation's leadership's mind. Uh, we can't trust the Europeans. Um, the moment there's an energy crisis, they will outbid us for every carrier of LNG, uh, for every rail car of coal, mm-hmm, and we'll mm-hmm. be stuck in the cold. They'll take care of themselves. And for all of their, um, you know, uh, pontificating about the need to reduce carbon emissions. When push comes to shove, they don't care. So we're not going to care. And we think that this will last several cycles. Um, that the mm-hmm. people, you know, fool me once, the famous George Bush quote, you know, best not fool me again. Um, right. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, the, yeah. The, the developing world it ain't going to be fooled again. And last we checked, as we said in the piece, there's roughly two orders of magnitude more people in the 99% um, than mm-hmm. in the 1%. Uh, funny how math works that way. But uh and so India, China, Pakistan, Indonesia, Bangladesh, um, South America, Africa, you, 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 they're going to get access to energy sources that are cheap, reliable, and easy to store. And coal fits all three of those. And if we don't understand why coal is so valuable, we have no hope of beating our addiction to it. Mm-hmm. Um, and the rest of the world, uh, one of the big lessons of the European energy crisis is, aha, I get it. We're going to go this way. Mm-hmm. So, as Mark Nelson said, the opening quote to the piece: "If you don't love coal, you'll never get rid of it." Yeah, it's so true. You know, I think that this is. Um, I mean, this is true even in America. There are a lot of people that are cheering on the death of coal. I think they lo- very wrongly attribute that to renewables. That was the shale booms doing, um, in addition to electricity restructuring, but. You know, I just can't, uh, I think there was a time in my life where I really would have celebrated that. And now it just scares me because the, what's going to replace it? Well, you know? this is, this is where our shared yeah. view, I believe is mm-hmm. that and less than until we get serious about truly, um, embarking on a nuclear renaissance, mm-hmm. all of this is just, um, cosplay. <laughs> like we're, we're yeah, just, yeah. Uh, we will stretch the band a little bit and then look look what happened with Joe Biden and mm-hmm. ahead of the midterms with the price of oil and by extension, the price of gasoline at the pump. Uh, Joe Biden, for all, whatever you think of him, is an old school politician. He's been around decades. Mm-hmm. You know, we used to call him uh, Joe Biden, Senator D, comma, DuPont. Like the guy knows commodities. Uh, DuPont yeah, is, or the, is, or, is or the man from MasterCard is, yeah, is yeah. I think, what other people have called him, um, too. But he he knows DuPont, he knows commodities, he knows yeah. gasoline. He's an old school politician. The price of the pump scares him, right? So mm-hmm. what happened? You know, um, five dollar gallon gas uh, proliferates across the country seven, eight, nine months before the midterms. A million barrels a day from the SPR, mm-hmm. berating the oil producers to produce more. Um, you know, full steam ahead on grabbing every BTU he could, just like the Germans. The Germans got through the winter mm-hmm. by paying the market clearing price. For every BTU of energy they could get their hands on, regardless of cost, regardless of carbon footprint, and regardless of secondary impacts to other nations. Mm -hmm. They did that. That's what they did. Congratulations. They made it through the winter. Half a trillion dollars later, they did it. Joe Biden, much the same thing from an environmental, you know, from his environmental base, they should be furious with them. A million barrels of oil a day from the SPR. What did that do to the price of oil? Collapsed it from Mm -hmm. its highs. What does that do for demand? Increases it. Mm-hmm. It is undeniable that Joe Biden's decision, which I happen to believe was the correct one, mm-hmm. um, to release a million barrels a day from the SBR, substantially increased our carbon emissions for 2022 and beyond. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was at $5 a gallon gasoline. 
now imagine if they actually implement their plans and we get ten dollars a gallon gas. Well, then you're in pitchfork territory. Yeah. So this is all just cosplay. It's all just theater. Nobody's serious. Um, they're paying lip service to their environmental base, but there isn't a single politician, with a few exceptions, on the progressive left that is actually willing to pay the political price to achieve their stated objectives. Mm -hmm. Period. Yep. Uh, and yeah, you know, I think we, that's right. That's just, just the way it's going to go. Like Joe Biden panicked at five dollar gasoline. And uh, I, yeah, it's a good thing that he panicked. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, like that was the right response. He also panicked at $10 gas, natural yeah. gas, right? Yeah. Because yeah. people with the heating bills were coming to. So what happened suddenly after the Freeport explosion, regulators slow rolled the, the reopening approval permits needed, right? And mm -hmm. that trapped a lot of natural gas here. Europe got blessed with a warm winter. If Europe had gotten crushed with a cold winter, I don't think Freeport LNG export would have been you know, re-permitted any faster. I mean, we would have hung those blow. I mean, you know, the, the whole Simo Hirsch controversial piece around whether the U.S. blew up Nord Stream. I mean, mm -hmm. when push comes to shove, the U.S. will cut Germany loose in the same way that Germany cut Pakistan loose. Yeah, no friends in a crisis, right? Correct. No friends like in a crisis. That's the that's the way it goes. So let me let me ask you this, because you said something that I think is is really provocative. It's something that keeps me up at night. You know, you said there were no serious politicians on the progressive left willing to do this. I think it, uh, and you might agree here. Uh, I know a lot of Republicans who are w way more copped on to reality when it comes to like ONG, but I think that we suffer from a lack of serious politicians overall. Oh, well, that's right? a bipartisan that's, issue. Let me be yeah, very clear. We, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, uh, what I want to ask is. How does that situation, this lack of seriousness, and we can just confine it to seriousness over energy uh, to avoid getting uh, both of ourselves in trouble. Um, how do we remedy this? How do we get the message across? How? What is your idea for how we think about energy changing? So this is where I don't have any good answers or even any optimistic ones. Mm. Um, who say more? But, Make me cry, Doomberg. Yes. Who, who, well, it's it's Doomberg. Don't come to us for the rosy outlook. <laughs> the what person with a combination of competency and ethics would be willing to run the personal destruction gauntlet to achieve high office in the U.S. today? Mm -hmm. So, in our view, the rot of the sort of hand-to-hand -hand combat. Of politics, the, what we've dissolved into um, in the U.S. means that anybody with any semblance of skill and or ethics is far better uh, remunerated in the private sector mm -hmm. unless they're willing to break the rules and be a lifelong politician who retires a centimillionaire um, and try to get away with it. You know, mm -hmm. uh, Insider trading, buying real estate just before a government development project, pick your favorite, but all the standard tricks. I mean, Harry Reid famously became extraordinarily wealthy um nancy pelosi you know pick your favorite um right yeah but yeah. and it's it's a bipartisan thing i mean the insider trading scandal is, is clearly very bipartisan um so if you have an ethical framework that would disqualify you from um feeding at the public trough and or you have significant skills that are marketable why would you spend any time in the public sector mm. like the private sector is way more valuable way less of like Interviewing for a job or starting a company pales in comparison to having investigators, you know, rifle through your high school yearbook to find something that uh, somebody said about you that uh, was questionable 35 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, you know, who 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 would subject themselves to that? It, it there's an expression in the chemical industry, you know, the still bottoms. You know, all the good stuff gets dist distilled off, and the people that are willing to go into public service are the still bottoms, the people mm -hmm. that have poor ethics or, or don't have the competence to succeed in the private sector. Um, now, that's not to say that every public servant or every administrator or every you know member of, uh, of Congress's staff is that way. But if you're a high profile politician, Ted Cruz, I mean, what was, I mean, let's be clear, we've only ever written with a Democratic president. And so therefore, many people assume you would um, support a Republican president. Um, you know, uh, without any sort of uh, critical analysis, quite the opposite. I mean, if we had mm -hmm. started when Trump was president, we would have had a field day with, with all. I'm, I'm sure you would have. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I've, I've never, I've never thought that you were anything but uh, 
you know, uh, bipartisan in your in your criticisms. Yeah. And when we, if we, if and when we do get a Republican president, um, people will see. Um, and in yeah. fact, you know, we put we wrote this piece on East Palestine that was actually, you know, this has become such a hyper political issue, but um, and it's being used to hammer Biden and, and his Secretary of Transportation. But we kind of wrote a piece saying, guys, this is like a big deal locally, but beyond that, you know, it's not a huge deal. We got many, many emails from incensed subscribers, like, how dare you, like, sure you did. the hook, right? It was like that's not. Yeah. That's not how we see it. So we're going to write how we see it. Um, and so to your question, I don't I don't know how I would never go into politics. I mean, mm -hmm. you would never you would probably never go into politics. Um, no, thought about it, but probably won't. Well, I hope you've lived a clean life. You know, it's um, well, that's why I won't. I've been in a 12 step program. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like what 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 keeps Mark Nelson in the private sector? You know, um, mm -hmm. it, it's it's a tough gauntlet. And in fact. The more effective you are as a politician, the more vigorous the personal tax will be. Um, and so yeah. uh, you get these still bottoms of people with loose, at, loose ethics or poor confidence. And, um, and I don't know what the answer is. Um, our representative democracy is basically broken. Mm -hmm. the, the administrative state basically writes all the rules. And um, yeah, and then it's a pay for play. Like, let's be very clear. Um, with enough money, you could buy government protection to create localized monopolies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting. I've been, you know, I've been, I think a funny thing about America is, is I think we often ignore except, accepting things like rock and roll and hip hop and some of our other pop cultural genius, frankly. We often ignore our own intellectual contributions. And so I've been sort of re returning to 19th century American authors, um, including presidents. And obviously the the best one to read, in my opinion, uh, other than perhaps um, men like John Quincy Adams would be uh, Lincoln. And when Lincoln was a young man, uh, a house rep, I believe, he gave a speech to a young man's lyceum. And in it, he's, he talks about the mobocratic sensibility. And what he's specifically addressing uh, is when people take the law into their own hands. And he says, you know, of course, this being unlawful isn't necessarily good, but, you know, it's the second and third order effects that hurt the most in the long run. It's that regular people uh, who just want to live unironic and relatively pr prosperous lives, raising their children become demoralized and lose faith uh, in the public trust. And third, sort of like the, the, the next order of effect that, that's going to happen, he says, is those who are noble will not aspire to leadership because it will be so obviously beneath them. It's, it's and, how I feel. I mean, it's... Yeah. yeah. And when I think about, I think about this, not necessarily in terms of the vigilante, uh, justice, though certainly uh, 2020 gave us much to think about. Um, I think about it also in terms of blackouts and what those do to the public trust. And that's what really worries me here is that um, I think we will keep screwing around with renewables provided natural gas sits around two, three bucks MMBTU. Um, and uh, it's going to be a high pain threshold moment when we start to learn from these mistakes and whether or not we have a leadership class uh, to guide us out of those mistakes is a whole other question because it won't just require uh, public sector leaders that we don't have, but also um, incredible roll up your sleeves bravery from the private sector as well. So two points. Um... I, I see your Abraham Lincoln, and I raise you the complete opposite end of the spectrum. And you can read uh, Robert Cairo's great uh, four-part series on Lyndon Johnson, which I think right, is, right. is the um, the beginning of the downfall of, of U.S. society. Um, in my in our view, he was you know deeply corrupt and, and grotesquely so, and hmm. um, and many of the things that he normalized uh, are still with us today, and and were catalysts for. Um, you, know, you could mark. I think the JFK assassination was a serious turning point in, in U.S. history. That's a that's a whole other show. Um, yeah, I think that's just a fact. Uh, Whether yeah. what you think yeah. that turning point sure. leads into yeah. is what's up for debate. <laughs> you, know? Yeah. It, yeah. you know, 
and, and then the second is, um, I think, we think, um, we're a little more optimistic on the second part about uh, about the energy grid and and so on. Um, wind is going to be stopped by the whales. Solar mm -hmm. is going to be stopped by slave labor in China, mm -hmm. and um, ultimately, like by non gasoline and natural gas. Um, the pain, the political pain. One thing about having short-term oriented politicians is they're highly responsive to political pain. And uh, since, that is true. Since the price elasticity demand uh, for energy is inelastic, it doesn't take much of a crisis to cause people to overcorrect. And uh, in the long run, the real scandal is that we don't have a renaissance of nuclear power to actually solve the real problem. So mm -hmm. we will be rolling the dice on carbon emissions. We are going to burn natural gas and coal and oil mm -hmm. uh, for as long as uh, we need to. And then, then we'll see whether the sort of catastrophic predictions of of the global warming or climate change alarmists come true. Um, I had a, a pretty interesting debate with um, with just such an individual, Professor Stephen Keen, on on another podcast, and mm. and he had a very um, he was convinced that the end of the world was coming. And my answer was, well, I, I hope you're wrong, but it's kind of like a Pascal's wager. I'll be opening up my finest bottle of wine I've been saving because if uh, brace for impact. Because we ain't changing, <laughs> right? Like we're we're gonna burn the coal, we're gonna burn the oil, we're gonna burn the right. natural gas, and um and we're just gonna have to deal with the consequences, and we are going to roll the dice. And and I do believe, you know, we again, like I don't want to keep saying we wrote a piece on it, but things that are interesting to us, we end up writing a piece about. Um, and we wrote a piece uh, in in I believe it was in November, um, called Exit Stage Left, um, about John Kerry potentially leaving, and and we made the point, like the developed world. The developing world is is going to roll the dice on climate change. Um, yeah, so we're about oh, to yeah. find out uh, if the world can handle a few degrees of warming if that warming materializes. Right. Absolutely. Well, Duberg, I think we'll end it there with a little bit of we're not neither black nor white pilled, but quantum pilled, perhaps, um, on what may happen. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to speak with me. Everybody, go to the show notes, subscribe. Follow Doomberg. All of that stuff is in there. If you don't already know, now you know. And remember, stay sharp, stay strong, and stay radiant. We will see you next time.